In this video, we ask and answer the question, what is narrative criticism, especially as it relates to New Testament texts? Much of what will be said in this video can equally apply to Hebrew Bible or Old Testament texts. The way one does narrative criticism of the New Testament is going to be similar to how one does narrative criticism of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, but our focus will largely be on the New Testament in this video. And so how I want to start is with a sort of unofficial lecture pause. I'm going to hold up 10 seconds and give you a 10 second countdown to think of all the narrative text in the New Testament. So what books of the New Testament might narrative criticism be relevant to? All right, so we're going to have six different books from the New Testament wherein narrative criticism might be relevant. All four of the canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are solely going to be narrative texts. That is, they consist entirely of narrative. That is also true of Luke's companion volume, the Acts of the Apostles. And then the sixth one that you might not have thought of right away is the book of Revelation. There are portions of Revelation that are story-like or narrative in nature. So when it comes to narrative criticism, I want to start out by giving us a clear definition of what narrative criticism is. Narrative criticism is an approach to interpreting biblical texts that reacts to historical criticism. Rather than focusing on the world behind the text, narrative criticism explores how texts work as literature, focusing thought on things such as narrator, plot, characterization, setting, and rhetoric through close readings of the text. So let's start out by thinking about what historical criticism is. Historical criticism, as we've talked about when we've talked about the world behind the text, sort of had its heyday really in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Um, and it's a way of interpreting the biblical text that focuses on the world behind the text, the history, the culture, and when we're thinking about the text itself, how the text came to be. Uh, of course, the world behind the text is still a very important part of the interpretive process. Thinking about uh, these issues is part and parcel for what we do in interpretation. Uh, but remember when we're sort of engaging the hermeneutical circle, we move between uh, the different worlds. So the world behind the text is going to be most closely related to historical criticism, where narrative criticism is going to be more closely related to the world of the text. So just as a reminder of the things that we're focusing on when we're thinking about the world behind the text, um, we're really approaching the text from the sort of the back end thinking about the author and how they put things into the text and thinking about the original audience or the first century audience of a given text. So we're thinking about things like author, date, location, and the original text insofar as we might be able to reconstruct it. Historical criticism and the world behind the text is a broad category that's going to consist of a lot of different kinds of approaches. The historical critical approach, source criticism, which is going to think about what different sources go into making up the final form of a text. Textual criticism, which is going to look at the different manuscripts that represent different versions of of a gospel, a letter, or whatever text it might be, and form criticism, which is going to think about the individual genres or the individual units inside of a text that are brought together uh, to make up eventually the text as a whole. And then redaction criticism, thinking about how an author or editor uses and changes sources in meaningful ways. All of those are thinking about sort of what is going on behind the text, whereas narrative criticism is going to uh, react to the historical criticism. Uh, criticism. That is to say, it's going to say, let's move our emphasis, not from what comes behind the text, but what we actually find in the text in its final form. So it is less concerned about thinking about who the actual author is, who the actual audience is in the first century, to think about who we are as readers and audiences, and how the text presents itself as a narrative. So those uh, the things that you would consider when you might be reading a modern novel and how a modern novel makes meaning, narrator, plot, character, setting, rhetoric, um, thinking about those kinds of things. So we shift our highlight in narrative criticism uh, and literary criticism from the left side over to the right side, and we set the text in its final form sort of at, uh, at center stage. So we have the final form of the text here, and from the final form of the text, historical criticism is going to look back and think about the important 
uh, the implied author and thus the real author. Whereas narrative criticism is going to look at the text to sort of construct the implied author and the implied audience with less respect to the real author and the real audience. So we sort of have a box here around the implied author, the implied audience. And we can think of the implied author as very similar to the narrator in a, in a narrative, the one that is sort of telling the story. Um, and the text presents or gives us an implied author that gives us an implied audience and then uh, we also we have real authors that do create this implied author. They create the text. They can create create the implied audience. But narrative criticism is less concerned with the real author and less concerned with the real audience on the other side here, and really focuses on the text and what is implied uh, implied by the text and how it affects us as real readers, not the first century audience, but a modern reader. So it's going to focus on the literary features of the text, the so-called who, what, when, where, and why. And if we're going to draw lines over to our who, what, when, where, and why with respect to literary features of the text, the who is going to be the characters, the what is going to be the plot, the when and the where is going to be the setting, and the why is going to be the rhetoric. And we should say that the who, what, when, where, and why is for not only the text as a whole, so for example, the entirety of the Gospel of Mark, the entirety of the Gospel of John, but also for specific passages. So what characters appear in one chapter versus another? Uh, what is the plot of the entire Gospel of John? And what is the plot of a single episode of Mark? How does the movement work in a single episode? How does the movement work in an entire episode? Where are particular things set in the Gospel of John? Where is the entirety of the Gospel of John set? And then the why is sort of the rhetoric, the what of a particular passage, and the what of the entire gospel. Uh, so what is the purpose of an individual story? What is trying to be communicated? And what is the purpose of the text as a whole? So to give us just to sort of dig a little bit deeper on the who, what, when, where, and why in literary terms, Narrative criticism is going to be concerned with things like point of view. This is going to be how the narrator or the implied author tells the story. What does the narrator or the implied author know and what do they communicate to the implied audience or us as the real audience, the real readers? What rhetoric, what rhetorical devices are used in a way to influence the reader to think, believe, and feel? feel certain things. Settings, and settings can be broken down into different kind of categories. Uh, so geographical, what place in the world does the story uh, take place in? Architectural, what is the specific building or area um, that that a given uh, passage is set in. Uh, a setting can be religious at a particular time or place at a festival in a temple would also sort of be a religious setting as well as an architectural setting. Uh, it can be temporal, that is related to time, whether it happens uh, in the morning, at noon, in the evening, or at nighttime. And it can be social. It can be at a meal. Uh, it can be engaging issues of purity or impurity, especially in the first century context, or issues of of economy. So there are different kinds of settings and where a given story is set with respect to these different kinds of settings is going to influence the way that it is read. Characters and characterization are also going to be another major literary aspect of narrative criticism, thinking about what characters do what things. So in any literature, in any narrative, characters are known by what they say and they do, what their posture is, what they wear, what their titles are, what is said about them by other characters or by the narrator, the settings in which they appear or don't appear, and how they change or don't change in the course of the story. And then lastly here, uh, plot is going to be how, again, how an entire uh, story advances over time, but it's also going to be about how a shorter story, an individual passage advances over time and how that affects some of these other as literary aspects. And we are not going to sort of go in depth on any of these in this particular video, um, but if you find sort of 
you want to explore more about a particular literary aspect. Um, if you find you're working on a passage and knowing more or understanding more about one particular literary aspect might be helpful for you, a very excellent resource for doing narrative criticism that's going to break down these individual elements uh, is James Risigui's, uh Narrative Criticism of the New Testament and Introduction. So what it really does is lays out what narrative criticism is and then goes into depth on each uh, on different kinds of literary aspects, telling you how you might explore these, giving you not only the theory behind uh, the literary aspects, but also sort of hands-on tools about how you might engage them and make meaning from them. So the last thing I want to do before I turn you loose for a lecture pause to summarize what we've talked about here is give you some principles for reading a gospel um, or Acts or a portion of Revelation as narrative. And this comes from a very influential book in the field of New Testament narrative criticism, Mark as Story. This, uh, this image here is of the third edition, which was published in 2012, but the first edition of Mark as Story was published back in 1982. And it really sort of instituted this change in the way that uh, biblical scholars thought about the Gospel of Mark first and foremost, uh, but then also the other Gospels as stories. It was sort of this uh, pivot point from thinking about the world behind the text or focusing on the world behind the text primarily to thinking about the world of the text and uh, specifically thinking about these texts as narratives. And uh, it was one of the first uh, book length projects that applied tools from literary criticism, sort of modern literary criticism, to a gospel text. And uh, in this book, uh, David Rhodes, Joanna Dewey, and Donald Michi lay out four different principles for reading the Gospel of Mark as a story that are equally applicable to reading the other gospels as stories. And I would suggest also the book of Acts and portions of Revelation as story. So the first principle is to read as story, not as history. So you can see how this is a focus on the world of the text, not the world behind the text. We're not necessarily thinking about who the characters were were historically, um, but we're thinking about how they function in the story world, really focusing on that story world uh, and setting aside, um, at least for the moment, what is happening historically or what the historical reference are. Uh, reading a given gospel independent of the other gospels. So how does Mark function as a story in and of itself apart from Luke? Or how does Luke function as a story in and of itself apart from the other gospels? So thinking about uh, thinking about each individual gospel as its own unit, not doing something like a synoptic study where we compare Matthew to Luke or how Matthew might have used Mark, but really focusing on each gospel as its own constructed story world. The next one is to avoid, avoid modern cultural assumptions. So really to try and uh, think about the story as an ancient story. So how, uh, how does the story function in its ancient environment as, uh, as an ancient story and not bringing in those things that we assume as modern readers of the text. And the same thing with respect to avoiding modern theologies about Jesus back into the gospel. Of course, there is a place for doing theology and sort of drawing theological principles out of a gospel, but the focus when doing a narrative reading of a gospel uh, or of Acts or Revelation is to try to not bring back into the text our modern understandings about Jesus, but try to think about how the story world presents Jesus or other characters or other uh, theologies within the story world. So the, the focus is really to try and focus in on what the story is and avoid the sort of modern things on this side and avoid the ancient things on this side so we can really sort of immerse ourselves in the story and the literary aspects of the story. And so to close us out here, I'm going to turn you loose to go ahead and uh, on your own, summarize what you have just heard here. So in about a paragraph and in your own words, so not repeating the definition I gave you of narrative criticism, describe what narrative, narrative criticism is and what the kinds of questions one might ask when doing narrative criticism.